very much. Um, what I want to do today is to tell you something about recent discoveries in the Severn Estuary and some other not so recent discoveries, but to try and link this together really with the whole theme of connections between wetland and coastal environments and the dryland inland sites, because I think that's the great challenge that we need to turn our attention to really, making this, uh, 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 establishing these patterns of connectivity. But first of all, to pick up on some of the points that, that Stephanie made in her talk uh, just now, um, the dynamic nature of these environments and the fact that discoveries, exciting discoveries, are always being made. And um, a, a writer called Julia Blackburn is doing a book at the moment, due out at Christmas, I believe, on the topic of Doggerland from a, an artistic and imaginative perspective. And I took her down to the Seven Estuary um, about a year ago, and within five minutes of getting to the, to the site, as the sea was going down, she picked up this early Upper Paleolithic Fort Robur Point, the first bit of archaeology she'd ever found. And uh, there it was, within five minutes of arrival. So you never know what you're going to find in these environments. And if one monitors and records what one finds on every suitable tide, then over a period of years, you can build up quite a detailed picture of the organisation of a, a little campsite, for instance. This is a Mesolithic campsite, which has produced hazelnuts, deer bones, um, a boar's tusk there, and lots of lithic artefacts. Very small scatter, this, only about five metres in diameter. But this pitch has been built up over steady recording um, over about six years. No excavation, just recording what the sea had already excavated. And that site is one of five that we've uh, worked on in the uh, Goldcliffe area, um, dates from about 5,800 Cal BC. Earlier this year, in April, um, I went down there with, with one of my students, Phil Terry, um, and discovered uh, this cut mark deer bone, also burnt, um, on a completely new area. We'd never found any Mesolithic archaeology at that spot before. Um, uh, we know what the date of the, the peat is, it's about 5,500 Cal BC, but presumably that may be suggesting uh, another activity area that we'll be keeping our careful eye on over the next few years. Uh, Phil has subsequently produced a very successful master's dissertation on isotope studies of deer and aurochs diet based on animal bones recovered um, over the years in the Seven Estuary. Now, the area I'm working in is particularly well known for the discovery of human footprints of Mesolithic date, and two of the best examples are shown here. They date between about 5,500 and 5,200 Cal BC. And the really exciting thing about these footprints is that a high proportion of them are those of children. Um, one of these um, aged about 11, and the other aged... Um, ab about eight. So this is telling us about a segment of the prehistoric population that um, very often we're completely ignorant about, really. They tend to be invisible from the archaeological record, except in, in terms of burials. So it's a new form of evidence, really, telling us about population structure and also particularly pertinent to my theme today, the way people were moving around the landscape, because I'm interested in how footprints and trackways and so on tell us about patterns of prehistoric connectivity, how the dots on the map that we call sites actually link together as parts of living landscapes. Now here's an example. This one came up last Tuesday. Um, it's a very poor example of a, of a human footprint, but I think you can see that it is a a human right foot, the big toe is very prominent, the footprint itself somewhat uh, distorted. But this is in an area which had been covered by an enormous sandbank for the last 11 years. We knew there were footprints there, but the sandbank just went on and on, building up until about two or three months ago when it started to disappear. So we're rushing around like blue ass flies at the moment, trying to, um, you know, record as much as we can from... Um, underneath this sandbank. Earlier discoveries here, um, this was on an occasion where the sandbank was more or less intact, 
and I took my students down there for their annual visit um, and there was only one little patch about two metres across of the underlying laminated sediments exposed but lo and behold it was covered with these wonderful footprints of cranes. I've been trying for 15 years to get decent footprint, crane footprints photographs and there they were on the little bit which just happened to be exposed on that day. And then again this week, another area of uh, crane footprints exposed underneath this sandbank. I hope you can see the footprints here. They're not quite as clear as the last slide, but nonetheless um, fascinating, I think, particularly because the crane has been extinct in Britain for centuries, and just at this time it's being reintroduced to the Seven Estuary uh, breeding program at Slimbridge and on the Somerset level. So really exciting. Our site is... Um, on the, within a, a, a nature reserve, the Newport Wetlands, and last year the cranes successfully bred within that nature reserve. So the, that establishes the relevance of what we're doing really to contemporary nature conservation issues um, in these coastal wetlands. <coughs> now drone survey was, was mentioned just now, and indeed that is absolutely transforming intertidal archaeology by creating the capacity to survey large areas very rapidly. This survey is of the area where we've been working on footprints for, for the last 15 years and we lacked an overall plan of this until last year when my colleague Dr Kevin White did this wonderful drone survey. It took about an hour and a half to do and it has established the sort of base map for all our previous and subsequent work. Uh, here's an example. This is what we did this week, actually. Um, the drone survey was done at the time when this great sandbank was intact, so you can't actually see the laminated sediments um, which produce the footprints. But here, superimposed on it, are the points which we picked up um, in about 20 minutes, I suppose, of survey this week. Um, projected onto the, onto the um, earlier uh, a segment of the earlier drone survey. So it's really valuable in connecting all these different observations made um, o over the years. And, and indeed, it's on the basis of the drone survey that we've created this sort of map, which shows trails of human footprints here picked out in red. And I think it's uh, quite clear from this that they're predominantly heading in this sort of direction. Um, heading towards the edge of an island um, where I'm sure there was a, a lost campsite. We've excavated five other campsites around this island, but this particular, the end point of these trackways, has been lost to erosion. But it does give you a clue as to how we can begin to pick up patterns of the Mesolithic geography in a landscape like this. But that is a cumulative picture. That's the result of about 10 years' recording of footprints um, each time we go down there. And most excitingly, that one of the areas that we worked on between 2011 and 2016 has actually enabled us to identify Mesolithic footpaths um, leading across the shoreline, again in the same general direction. They're very poorly preserved footprints, as you can see from the photographs, but nonetheless... In places, you've got distinctive features and you've got the sort of right-left bipedal gait that enables you to convincingly demonstrate that one is dealing with humans. Now, what makes that, those footpaths really exciting is the discovery, during the drone survey, actually, of a wooden structure. Um, in doing the drone survey, we had to put out about a dozen targets on the foreshore in order to knit together the uh, hundreds of pictures that were taken by the drone into one 3D image that I showed you earlier. That took us to a bit of the foreshore where I was absolutely convinced there was nothing there, so we'd never been out there, you know, completely eroded away, not interested. But my colleague, Tom Walker, who's done a lot of this work with me, um, as he was putting his target down, he saw some posts sticking out of the mud. And... Um, Rather irritatingly, he suggested that these might be of some interest. We got a radiocarbon date from them, and they turned out to be about 5,000 Cal BC, part of a wattle work fence, almost certainly a Mesolithic fish trap. So you can see some of the roundwood 
vertical elements and then the, the wattles driven diagonally in in order to make a sort of V-shaped uh, fish trap, I think probably for eels. And these timbers, when excavated, are really wonderfully preserved with great dished axe marks um, on the surface. Mesolithic worked wood in Britain is incredibly rare, actually, and we're still grappling, really, with the whole uh, question of how these axe marks were actually produced. Could it be done with a sort of primitive tranché-type axe, or does it require a polished axe? And I'd welcome uh, uh, any thoughts on that that you may have. Um, here's a plan of those structures, um, lines of posts in a sort of V-shape. Um, there are probably three separate features of that, which that is the, the, the most clear. We've uncovered some more of these actually at the beginning of this week, so that plan is not absolutely come up to date. To reinforce the point about the recording of, of, the, of these sites over extended periods, here's a, a plan of one of the other areas we've worked on. This is the area of the Redwick um, Middle Bronze Age settlement. Um, and that plan is the result of recording between 1995 and 2012, 17 years of recording put together to make quite a detailed plan of the archaeology which is uh, Mesolithic to Middle Bronze Age in this particular case. And there, the upper part of that, this is the view of the peat shelf that's exposed on the foreshore at low tide where there were complete Bronze Age building plans revealed by coastal erosion. This hasn't involved major excavation. All we've done is cleaned off the surface to reveal the posts and then mark the posts by white plastic labels in order to get that photograph. Also significant is the fact that there are sort of gullies around them. There were four of these buildings altogether. Gullies around them covered in the footprints of cattle and cattle turn out to be a really important part of, of this story, I think, because the reason people were down in these coastal wetlands, I suspect, was to graze their animals seasonally on the salt marsh. And this was just at the limit, the tidal limit. It, it goes back to the point that Damien was making earlier, actually. People were living absolutely at the high point of spring tidal influence, where you've just got a bit of silt coming in um, and touching the buildings effectively. Both the Iron Age and the Bronze Age buildings that we found all had those silts coming up to them to their very edge. So they wanted to get as near to the salt marsh as possible without being inundated um, very regularly by the tide. Here's an Iron Age one. This is at Gold Cliff um, and it's exciting because it had um, oak plank walls dated to April, May 273 BC. So it's a very precisely dated uh, prehistoric structure. And there's a reconstruction of uh, its environmental setting. Again, absolutely at the limit of, of high water um, spring tide um, and with animals grazing on the salt marsh and the, and the raised bog behind it. So this question of animal grazing and so on introduces us to the whole theme of how these sites were connected with what was going on on dry land. And I've sort of created this hypothetical model here which shows the, um, the trackways and the, um, the, the little seasonal rectangular buildings um, out on the, the wetland um, and the, uh, the notion that it may have been connected to more permanent agricultural settlements on dry land. But the thing is, you know, how do we establish those particular patterns of connectivity? How do we establish whether this model is correct? Well, to some extent, from the coastal wetlands, we can get partway towards that by looking at the evidence for which season people were there. And that's the purpose of this circular diagram here, which brings together all the environmental evidence and the animal remains and the plant remains to suggest that people were actually out on the salt marsh between about May and maybe as late as the middle of August, but um, possibly not for quite as long as that, um, pasturing their, their animals. And there's a, there's a good deal of environmental evidence to support that wetland uh, end of the story. But 
What we often lack, really, is any clear evidence for patterns of connectivity into dry land. Here's an example from the Somerset levels, where you've got in red some of the Bronze Age trackways. And you can see those trackways sort of radiate from particular points on the dry land, which presumably may point to the existence of, of Bronze Age settlements. But there is no case um, in this area where we can actually find a routeway going on to the dry land. In fact, you know, I'm not absolutely sure that anybody's ever actually looked for that. Perhaps that's the sort of thing we ought to, we ought to be a bit more focused on. There are examples. This is a lovely site at Broskov in Denmark where you've got a stone causeway of um, 300 AD with a series of hollow ways leading down from Celtic fields on the slopes above to that uh, crossing point. So here we can make a direct connection between um, a wetland causeway and routeways um, leading into it. And to some extent, there are hints of the similar sorts of things in, in South East England. The work that Dave Yates did in um, the recording of coaxial field systems in the Thames estuary and uh, the Kent coastal areas and so on, um, demonstrated that were significant droveways and trackways running through these fields, and some of them certainly lead down to salt marshes on the River Thames and the Kent, uh, Kent marshes as well. So this may be um, evidence for the role um, that these coastal environments played at the time of very extensive coaxial field systems that's to say, from Middle Bronze Age into the Iron Age. And I've been trying to investigate this topic for, for a book which I've been writing um, from the point of view of identifying um, dryland routes. Uh, this is an example in the Brighton and Shoreham area on the south coast, where in red I've picked up out a number of um, early routeways which lead from the coast and the coastal plain across the chalk down and into the weald. And two of those routes you can demonstrate were in existence by the Iron Age. There's one here where the, it passes through the entrance of a, an Iron Age hill fort at Thunders Barrow, and another one here where there is a Roman barrow on top of a positive lynchet along the edge of one of these routeways. Um, another site there where there's a Roman burial also in a lynchet. So these trackways appear to be of pre-Roman date and um, the key thing is that they run against the topography. That's the escarpment of the South Downs. This is the South Downs Way picked out by a black broken line. But all these routes are connecting together different environment types. They're not running, they're not ridgeways at all, for which, frankly, I think there's very little convincing evidence for their prehistoric significance, actually. They are counter to the topography, running out into the weald. And uh, this is some photographs of that route. Here's a terrace way that's part of that route. Um, and um, that's the barrow on top of the lynchet. And then a great big hollow way, deeply incised into the landscape. Um, a route which I think originated at least as early as the Iron Age. Then if we look at the North Downs in Kent, you've got these um, multi-flex cross-topography routes which were um, originally identified on the basis of, of work on the medieval landscape. Um, very closely spaced, one to two kilometres apart, but again connecting together different environment types. And the origin of some of these may be suggested by work that was done for um, HS1 here at Whitehorse Stone, where they found Neolithic features orientated in a north-south direction, possibly suggesting that some of these routeways may be of much earlier origin. The same study suggested that the, um, the Ridgeway-related uh, route, the Pilgrim's Way, probably didn't go back much before the 6th century AD. So there are ways of getting at the origins of these um, distant patterns of uh, communication, but it is, I think, something which needs a, a far greater focus by archaeologists. 
Here's another bit of work that came out of HS1, the Saltwood Tunnel in Kent, where the Bronze Age landscape, the Bronze Age trackways, are actually perpetuated in the present day landscape. The Bronze Age trackways shown in red and the present day routes in, in brown. And you can see that the, the, the basic framework of that landscape was clearly established during the Bronze Age. Now, all the way around the coast of the British Isles, there are an extraordinary number of coastal um, wetland sites. And I've tried to bring that uh, richness together with, uh, on this map, which highlights, of course, in particular, the significance of the trackways and double post alignments that are characteristic of the, of the Thames estuary um, here. And it also picks out, I think, interesting contrasts between um, areas um, and it is at the moment only in the Seven Estuary, I think, where we've got these buildings that are actually out on the edge of salt marsh environments. There are more examples than I've, than I've shown you, but they're all um, Middle Bronze Age to Iron Age. In the Thames Valley, there are many trackways uh, connecting river terraces uh, with, the, with the floodplain. Some examples shown here from Freemasons Road and Beckton. Um, and the idea here seems to be really that they were perhaps connecting agricultural landscapes of coaxial field systems on the terraces with the resources of the floodplain. And maybe the uh, structure at Vauxhall, the uh, double post alignment, a very substantial post dated, I believe, to about 1500 BC, may be um, such an example of, a, of, a, of some sort of bridge. Ebb's Fleet, site that's already been mentioned, there's another example of a routeway running in a rather different direction along the edge of the, of the floodplain, picked out in different ways by pit clusters, barrows, um, little bits of um, uh, brushwood track and so on. And here at Harters Hill in Somerset, dendrochronologically chrono dated uh, 1076 to 1049, another of these double post structures crossing a bit of the Somerset levels. So I hope I've been able to identify the additive value of long-term observations and recording, 27 years actually at Goldcliffe. New things appear all the time, and if they're carefully recorded, they can make sense at some point in the future. Drone survey and GPS are transforming our capacity to do intertidal archaeology. Footprints, I think, have a huge potential for looking at patterns of prehistoric connectivity, and they must be far more widespread than has been reported. The discovery of Mesolithic fish traps and associated footpaths is perhaps our most uh, exciting recent discovery. And I think we're just beginning to learn how to identify prehistoric routeways and patterns of wetland, dryland connectivity. But that's very much a, a work in progress. The Middle Bronze Age coaxial field systems, droveways and Thames Valley trackways uh, may well provide important clues to this pattern, these patterns of connectivity from the Bronze Age and Iron Age. And I think there is growing evidence for prehistoric cross-topographic routes in southeast England, particularly round the edge of the Weald. And of course, these double post alignments, which may um, represent bridges. Uh, my final point here really is to highlight the relationship between all this work we're doing on coastal archaeology and um, the nature conservation issues. And it's really... Uh, delightful from my point of view that just in the last few months an HLF project called the Living Levels has been established in the Gwent Levels where we've done uh, quite a bit of our work creating the opportunity to highlight these connections um, and involve people in the, the sort of joint investigation of the heritage and the, um, the, the natural history of these landscapes. So um, Without more ado, I'd like to thank all those that have been involved in these surveys, the many organisations that have uh, contributed to the funding 
um, and uh, I'd be happy to answer questions uh, at some point if any of you have any.